It's always wonderful to see the um, dynamics of um, these meetings, that the room fills up in very strange ways. First, only that side, and then right now we have an empty space right here, uh, which is interesting. I, I don't know how anybody's going to reach that space if the room becomes full. So perhaps during the coffee break, we can rearrange ourselves a little and, and let the speakers at the front not feel so lonely um, um, when, when we're doing the conversations. Good morning, my name is Wayne Modest, and I would like to welcome you to the Research Center for Material Culture, to the National Museum of World Cultures, to the Museum Volkerkunde, for this one of our um, ongoing set of conversations around the work of museums like ours, what we may call world cultures, museums, ethnographic museums, or more generally, the work of museums are along very different parameters. Um, since April last year, and probably a little earlier, because our first conference under the Research Center was a conference on rethinking photographic practices and, and, and the photographic collections in our museums, um, of which we have an enormous collection, and, and we were trying to think about those collections in, 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 to push the edge of where contemporary theory about those collections are right now. Um, as that impact on our practice that was called Imagine Selves. We've been having a set of conversation, and I would like to say a set of conversation among peers, among friends. Uh, it, it is quite interesting that if I look along the list that uh, we've managed to bring out a, a few very new people to our uh, conversations, but notwithstanding people we know, I look at the list and I see Katia, who we've been in conversation with, or uh, I see Robin from the UFA, who we've been in conversations with as well, and, or, or, or Victoria, uh, um, who I've been in conversation with her book um, <laughs> for a while. So um, we, we bring out these conversations as an attempt to try and push um, the practice. As many of you might know, ethnographic museums have been going through, for the last 10, 15 years, a lot of changes, a lot of um, ongoing conversations, discussions about what are our futures, our presence and our futures, and what is our role in contemporary society. For many people, those conversations happen, um, are, are absent, to be honest with you, because sometimes you hear the dense discussion that happens within the curatorial department or within the museum as a whole, the collections department and the different departments actually never get translated. And that's one of the interesting things about what, what, when you think about these things called permanent exhibitions. Their permanence means that sometimes some of the changes that are happening never get seen. So this, um, the forum that we create now is also um, to rethink what the seenness, the visibility of our own internal practices um, are by staging these ongoing conversations around the museum and what its present is and its future. So digital horizons, virtual selves, rethinking the cultural heritage in, in museums, and that we have gone through many iterations of this title. <laughs> It started about our own digitality, digital cultures in ethnographic museums. Um, but notwithstanding, it is for us an, 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 an urgent theme. Within the Research Center for Material Culture, we've, we've nominated certain research themes, and the question of digitality is one of them. We thought to think about the digital um, for two reasons. On the one hand, you know, and I was at a conference a few years ago where when somebody made the statement that museums have always been at the cutting edge of, of, um, of digital practices. Once the computer came, we had it. Once the, 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 it came, we had it. And it gets obsolete over and over and over and over again, and we change it. We have the databases, we have whatever. So to look at that, the museums as a, as a, a space where the digital has takes space and what happens with it in the museum. And that includes an engagement with the massive database that we try to create, understand, to document, and to share with our different publics, and to think about a refiguring of what the documentation system mean for how we articulate with our publics. But there was a second side to the questions of the digital, and that emerged in conversation with the two organizers today, and I'll introduce them after but also out of um, our own thinking about if we were, 
if we are an institution that has for a long time been addressed at this question of the, what I call the cultural subject. Well, that's what, how we put it in the museum. We deal with this thing called the cultural. We deal with um, culture. Then what happens in the time of digital culture? What happens when that cultural subject, in what ways does the digital or do the digital, does the digital affect this idea of cultural subjectivity? How we experience ourselves as cultural subjects? How do we form ourselves as cultural subjects? That is particularly interesting as another way of thinking about the digital as well. And one of the, um, I've had a little bit of a pet peeve, and anybody who've, who's heard me speak about this will have, would have heard it, and I think Lisa and, and Karen will bring it more to the fore later on. I've had the pet peeve that from the moment that I read the book, um, the book by Housinger about play, then I was interested in the question of gaming, games, play, and what it means for cultural subjectivity. And I was interested in, then I started to think, oh, we should do an exhibition on that. And look at what we have in our collections and what would it look like if we were to put it on. And then I started to ask the question, at what point did we stop collecting games? And why is it so that I can find the Makala board the chess game, the this, the that, all of them from all over the world. But then as, at the moment that it reached the digital, it was not our, our purview anymore. Why is that? And does that say anything about our own interest in it or the possibilities that we have to care for it? Why is that? These are only some of the thoughts that, 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 that were part of my thoughts as I entered into a conversation with Lisa and Karen, who you will hear from later on, who I'd like to, at this point, thank for bringing this together, because this is, this is um, I saw these were two students who came to me and said, we have an idea. And I said, oh, you have an idea, ha, ha, ha. And it was a wonderful idea that they had this idea to put on this conference and to bring a group of people together to think through this rather complex conversation. So, I want to thank you both for thinking about it, for formulating it, for bringing people from as far as the east coast of the uh, west coast of the US um, to Germany, all over, to create this international conference to think about questions of the digital. And what does it mean for a museum like ours that um, has a, a love affair with the digital, but needs to understand how do we use that in terms of mapping other futures for how we represent the life world that we do. Thank you all for coming. Thanks to Lisa and Karen. And hopefully we will, um, I, 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 he doesn't want me to say this, I'm sure, but when I, when I, when we sp when I spoke to Robin, he's, he did say that he's going to be feisty this morning. He's going to ask a lot of terrible questions and criticize the ethnographic museum. And we said, we said welcome. So let it be, let it be a, a conversation. But what we want to do is to push practice. So you don't have to be polite about the criticism that you have, even about the framing and the, and the things that we want to do. Let us have a dense, good debate discussion. For those of you who do not know, we are, well, you see it, we are recording this. We record all our events because we want our website to be a space where these discussions are accessible. And um, Lisa and Karen will say as well that um, it is hoped that through their push, um, which is going to be required, that a publication of some sort will come from this. I, Lisa, Karen. Hello, everyone. You're with a lot. Thank you for coming. Um, digital technologies have changed the ways museums preserve, make accessible, and present cultural heritage. Disclosing collections on digital platforms vis allows visitors to use, share, reframe, and represent these collections. Digital technologies such as photo ma manipulation software and 3D scanning have led to new forms of heritage interpretation, revealing objects in a new light. Digital technologies also play an increasingly decisive role in the physical exhibition space. <coughs> Apps, multimedia tours, virtual reality devices are applied to contextualize museum objects, 
provide additional information and actively engage visitors as participants. As Wayne already uh, stated, the National Museum of World Cultures follows this trend. Recent projects such as Photo Soup Family, a project that aims to reunite 300 family photo albums from the former Dutch East Indies with their rightful owners. Roots to Share, a digital repatriation project of historical photos made in, in Greenland from the collection of the Museum Volkenkunde Leiden and Museum The Hague. And Museum Explorer, an innovative app that aims to enrich the museum experience through the employment of iBeacon technology, all relied on the ability of digital technologies to make the museum collection accessible, to increase visitor participation, and experiment with co-creation and repatriation strategies. And although these kinds of projects demonstrate that the museum is actively engaging with and exploring the potential of the digital, it hasn't led to a thinking of digital practices and object objects as possible heritage worthy of a place in a museum collection. In this museum, the digital is still understood and employed as a tool or kept as documentation in the media library, but it does not have the status of a creative work or cultural practice in its own right that requires serious investigation. <coughs> So how can we remember the digital age? What will be left of its future? Should museums take responsibility and care for digital heritage? Within this conference, this question will be approached from two angles. The first is quite concrete. What could be interesting for the anthropological museum to collect? Which part of digital culture is relevant for these museums? so we can give present and future generations ideas about what our digital age comprehends. And what if certain digital practices are selected? How will these challenge the traditional museum practice, ranging from collecting policies to presentation and preservation strategies? And what could be possible solutions? These last questions are related to a second perspective. Digital heritage is challenging traditional museum cultures, maybe even more than any other medium. Political and social interests determine cultural memories, but also changes in technical media. Written or printed text gave us different access to the past, or give us different access to the past, than images do. Photography frames and freezes historical moments. Films gives us a view on history in motion. Our contemporary ideas about the past have been highly influenced by the digital realm. With the emergence of the digital, we gain a new form of writing. In the electronic environment, writing is nothing more than technical calculations, and digital data is in an endless flow, constantly changing and circulating. This makes our ideas about writing as an inscription or long-term trace no longer applicable. As Elida Asman argues, it's the first time that the long-term stability of writing has been called into question. And related to that, we also need to re-examine our ideas on historicity. The process of historicization can be difficult when we deal with continuously changing entities. How to collect, name, or categorize them. This is a great challenge for museums when dealing with digital heritage. Traditionally, these institutes preferred stability and as such try to resist the flow of time. But how can museums also embrace fluidity, variability, and change? Can they approach the past as always new? Historical processes as continuously in flux? Comparable with the always changing processes of life? And what new opportunities will this offer for museums? Another important characteristic of the digital is its ability to stimulate co-authorship. In addition to that, also this lesson has been written collaboratively. Not only did Lisa and I share our knowledge expertise, but also the curators within the National Museum of World Culture shared their reflections on digital heritage with us. And this is also where Wayne was referring to. Leading up to the conference, a lively online discussion was generated after an email of Wayne Modest, in which he proposed the video game 
never alone, alongside the question, could we acquire such a game? This lecture takes this conversation as starting points, since it precisely reflects the question we want to raise within the conference on how does the digital make us rethink memory strategies within museums. But for that, first let us take a look at the trailer of the game. Imanga kanga to aho ru kanga xilla blue king one ting le artwata kanga xip karoa ing de rosia nuna sude kanga inyonek put iloani Agla, Shukravat, Utukat Kulak Tuat, Al Rashuta, Tat Kamna, A Victor Tamut. Tamna Shivunerebu, Mumina Piralyoktu. Kathirin, <laughs> Within the trailer of the game, it is mentioned that the main goal of the game, Never Alone, is to share Inupiat culture and history with new audiences. The digital medium offers new ways to visualize, appropriate, and engage with the past. <coughs> Within the game Never Alone, the cultural history of the Inupiat is not only translated towards the present, present time and shared with new generations, but it also aims to share these stories with audiences all over the world. This restaging of the past gives interesting new directions for the collecting policies of museums. Can a museum keep cultural memory, or for example the Inupiat, alive by collecting new media for memories? Can we broaden our ideas on the game as a representation, and could we also see it as part of a cultural and social memory process, in which the past is continuously changing? It is important not to confuse historization, or the activity of historical preservation, and commemoration. Both are forms of historical reconstruction, but there are some important distinctions. The main focus of historization is on the investigation of evidences from the past, and for the interpretation of these traces, we rely on a small group of authorities. In contrast, social memory is a group process that keeps memories alive within different generations. The act of memory depends on the past, but it always happens within the present. The interpretation of history is not a strict reconstruction of the past, but it's shaped by the present time as well, which makes it powerful alive. Within museums, the emphasis lies on the historical state of the cultural objects. But as Karen Workman, director of the Museum of the Person said, it is also possible within museums to emphasize the memory process. She even argues that in some projects this is more important than the actual cultural objects. Beginning of the quote. 
It may be that the most important factor of the digitization project is not the creation of the digital collection as such, but the group's engagement in the, proce in the process that motivates new generation to value their history." End of quote. Can the museum, in particular the Anthropological Museum, function as a keeper of social memory processes? Can museums incorporate the dynamics of time, engage communities, and support the sharing of different cultural perspectives? <coughs> In order to shift from a museum practice in which objects are central to a practice that emphasizes processes, museums should rethink their definitions of objects and their materiality and the value system that underlies these definitions. Despite efforts to increase attention and acknowledgement for Im immaterial heritage, museum culture is still highly object-centered. This object-centeredness is related to the prevailing importance of values such as aura, authenticity and originality, and the idea that these values are intrinsically linked to an object's materiality. <coughs> Physical objects are thought to literally embody history, and in the context of the ethnographic museum, also the people who made them. They are physical traces of the past through which culture and history can be read. Being in the presence of objects that have a direct link to an event often triggers powerful reactions and emotions. The smell, texture, sound, and taste of a physical object plays an important role in attributing meaning and value. Digital media, supposedly lacking this sensuality and indexical materiality, are not valued as authentic or original, or of capable of triggering deep emotions. They are treated as mere replicants, as inferior representations of our reality, as documentation of the physical. If the argument of indexical materiality is no longer given preeminence in museums and museums shift attention to other factors to determine an object's heritage value, digital objects could be given a chance to perform roles that go beyond reproduction, documentation, entertainment and education. Returning to the question whether museums can function as keepers of cultural memory processes, we should remember that all objects, both physical and digital, are part of social and cultural networks from which they are detached and dislocated once they become museum objects. Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimlet refers to this process of alteration as the poetics of detachment and suggests that we should not speak of ethnographic objects but of ethnographic fragments. The acquisition of digital objects might provide opportunities to avert the act of producing fragments. With digital objects, objects like apps, websites, and virtual cities, it is no longer self-evident where an object begins and where it ends, who creates it, circulates it, and owns it. In case of Never Alone, the museum should accept and defend the object as a living entity that continues to be part of changing social and cultural networks. Focusing more on the social network that surrounds an object allows allows moving beyond a discourse that approaches history from one dominant fixed per perspective. <clears throat> Never Alone is the first game produced by an indigenous commercial game company in the US of A, and is the result of a co-authorship <coughs> between game developers and people from the Inupiat community. The game's narrative is based on oral histories that were selected, interpreted, and rescripted for the game in collaboration with nearly 40 people from the community. The game also incorporated and remediated aspects of the visual and material culture of Denupiat in its design and story, such as drawings, dress and utensils, and integrated detailed aspects of the geographical circumstances in which the histories take place. As such, the game is a result, reflection and reconstruction of contemporary and historical social memory processes and forms a participatory archive that communicates individual and collective memories. This do does not imply that the Inupiat are the only stakeholders or representatives of this game. Rather, because the main goal of Never Alone is to share Inupiat culture with new audiences throughout the world, the circulation and perhaps even appropriation of this game in different cultural contexts and communities 
is an essential part of what the game entails. It is intended to be an object in flux. If the museum decides to collect Never Alone, it should be aware of its re responsibility as a keeper of social memory processes. The museum should treat the game as a live, interactive and dynamic process and stimulate the formation of new social and cultural networks for this game. We could question if the interactivity within this game is participative enough. It can also be shared with different communities that cannot only passively con consume it, but actively made it their own, make it their own. Is the code, for example, open source? Can other programmers change the game? Is there a Creative Commons license that makes it possible for the audiences to reappropriate the game? Or is there an additional website or online forum that offers opportunities for conversations <coughs> and debates? Over time, the Inupiat culture will be represented and remediated in new cultural forms, contexts, and archives to keep the traditions alive. History from this perspective is in continuous change. Museums could facilitate this and employ their historicizing function. They could map and document where, ob uh, where objects have been reused or components of objects have been reused. And in some cases, for example, in the case of Never Alone, it could also be considered to become part of the collection. Thank you. <laughs>